This viscast is going to look at a time independent and the complete time and spatial dependent versions of a wave function. Pause the video and read through the question carefully. What you should have been able to determine is we've been given for a particle with a time invariant potential its energy eigenfunction here which is the term we use to refer to the spatial dependent component of its wave function there lowercase psi of x. We're also told the particle has a particular energy associated with this energy eigenfunction given here in this case written as h bar times omega 1. And the question wants us to find this full wave function, the full space and time dependent wave function there, capital Psi of X and T. So what we can say if our potential is time invariant and we've been given this spatial component here, that the full space and time dependent wave function here, capital Psi of X and T, will be equal to that lowercase Psi simply of position multiplied by a time dependent factor here, a time dependent function that we often call um, Phi of T. And with all of these conditions in place, we know that that time-dependent uh, function there, independent of any of the details of the potential, is always written as e to the minus i multiplied by the energy divided by Planck's constant on 2 pi, h bar there, all multiplied by time. So regardless of the potential, as long as the potential doesn't depend explicitly upon time, this will always be that time-dependent factor in our wave function. And so we can now write this out in a little bit more detail. Our energy eigenfunction we're told is capital A sine kx. And we can write now for our time dependent function here e to the minus i. Now the energy divided by h bar for us up here will just be omega 1 when we divide through by h bar multiplied by time. So there's our wave function. You can see it's a complex wave function. It's got this complex exponential here. And the question is asking us to write the real and imaginary parts of that wave function. So let's think about how we might do that. We can write that for our energy eigenfunction here, which is a real function, multiplied by, let's write out the components of this exponential, this complex exponential here. And you should know from your mathematics that I can write this as cosine omega 1 t minus i sine omega 1 t. And then quite clearly by, uh, by expanding that, I can find one that is completely real here a sine kx cosine omega 1 t and one here that involves the complex unit i that'll be a sine kx sine omega 1 t and so we can identify quite easily that's going to be the real part of my full wave function and this here is going to be the imaginary part of my full wave function there and although you might have thought this energy eigenfunction looks real my full wave function turns out to be imaginary. Is that a problem? Well, no, because you know that for most calculations we're going to do, in fact, for all calculations we would do to get a quantity that's actually a measurable or observable quantity, we actually must end up with a real value for that. And so, for example, when we find the probability distribution for this particle, we would take, of course, um, the modulus squared of our full wave function, or if you like, we would take the complex conjugate multiplied by the original function. And that will always turn out to give us a real value. This tells us something interesting about sometimes how we would visualize or imagine we would visualize a wave function. Here's a picture here of a wave function that looks a little bit like a sine wave. And you can see it's sort of sitting there. But what we often don't realize that this isn't necessarily the entire wave function. This might be just one part of the wave function. And in fact, typically we're thinking about it only as a function of space. Whereas if we do think about it as a function of time, we find that it actually is going to oscillate in time. So what we often draw for our wave function, rather than the full space and time dependent part, is basically kind of the spatial envelope of our wave function. And if we stop there for a second, I can tell you this is actually only the, uh, the real part. I could also pop up there the imaginary part, which is there in blue. And so my full wave function, and of course I've got those plotted on the same axes. In some sense, they're kind of mathematically orthogonal to each other. You can see that by, if I now do a time dependent kind of play of this here, you can see that the real part there, that's in orange, and the imaginary part there in blue are actually kind of at right angles to each other as they're oscillating. And that's a fairly standard feature of our full wave function. And the interesting thing, which you could probably show mathematically, but we'll show visually here for a second if I pause that, if I now also plot on there the magnitude of the wave function, okay, that is the square root of the absolute value squared, 
So it would definitely be a real part. Won't have a real and imaginary component anymore. And let's just get rid of the imaginary part there just for a second. And if I now make this go as a function of time, you can see the real part definitely oscillates there in time. The imaginary part was also oscillating in time. We can just pop that back up in there. There's the imaginary part also oscillating in time. That's the blue curve there. But in fact, if I just look at the magnitude, the magnitude sits there constant in time. So I've got an oscillating wave function, an oscillating complex wave function, with its real and imaginary parts oscillating essentially out of phase, but at the same frequency, leading to the magnitude of the wave function that's actually constant.